Here's a topic that's come up actually uh, about three times in conversation over the last couple of days. Um, someone asked me the other day if there are any shows that I watch just sort of like, you know, something that's silly or fun. And the answer is no. And the reason why is because when in trying to watch uh, certain shows, God, the Holy Spirit has always grieved me about it. And I believe that the reason why, or at least what he has taught me, is that I need to be occupied by him. And I need to be deriving joy from what he derives joy from, what he finds joyful. Because I'm supposed to become holy as God is holy. Can you imagine God being a couch potato and distracting himself or vegging out with a show at the end of the day? I, I highly doubt that. I'm supposed to be occupied by him. I'm supposed to become holy as he is holy. And the majority of shows, even those that seem innocuous, seem like, you know, not a big deal. What I had, I had also found is that there always ends up being some sort of propaganda built in, some sort of mentality built in that is not befitting of a child of God. Now, someone contacted me today and asked me a question about a show that she had found on uh, Amazon Prime. And it was a show that uh, was based on, or a movie that was based on the book of Matthew, and it was verbatim, word for word, what's written in a particular version of the Bible. And she wanted to know uh, what I thought about that. What What's my experience with that? Here's my experience. I used to watch a movie uh, that was based on the book of John, and it was word for word that I think it was the ESV version or something, or maybe the New Living Translation. The problem is when you are entertaining yourself with something like that, you start to have a relationship about God. You start to develop an image of God, an internal representation that is an image. An image is not just something that you see with your eyes or you envision in your mind. It's something that gets into your heart, an internal representation of who you believe Christ is. You and I are not defined by our words and neither is God. That's the reason why you can't read the Bible and understand God or relate with God without his Holy Spirit. It is a living word and you have to relate with his Holy Spirit in order to understand what's written in that word and in order to have a relationship with him. And so when you're watching someone else portraying Jesus on a movie or a show, you're not having a relationship with God. You're having a relationship about somebody else's interpretation of who God is and how those things are, how what he has said is portrayed. Moreover, who in the world thinks that they are in a position to represent Christ? That is a whole lot of arrogance and presumption to think that you can represent Christ in a movie. And so there are many ways that you can add to the scroll. You can add to the scroll by adding your own gospel by adding your own interpretations, spinning it into a story, which we've seen that happen over the last couple thousand years. And you can also add to the scroll by adding characteristics to Jesus that are not in the scroll. I'm going to give you an example of that. When I was watching that particular movie and the Holy Spirit began to grieve me and then talk with me about, you know, why it was that he was grieving me because I thought, well, this is word for word though. There was a, a particular scene where Jesus is uh, telling people that he is the bread of life. And he's the character in the movie is saying, I am the bread of life. And he's like shouting this. I mean, the word says that he did not raise a cry in the street, a bruised reed he did not break. How are you going to represent him like that? And my friend, as I was talking with her on the phone today, said something to the effect, was talking about, you know, the scene where uh, he's flipping over the table, the money changers tables in the um, temple. And she said, you know, they were presenting him as though he were a human being, right? Like, so they're presenting him as though he's, he's somehow lost it, like he's out of control. Well, we know that's not true. We know that's not true because the word tells us that God's spirit is a spirit of love, power, sound mind, and self-control. So they should not, no one should be representing Jesus as though he's some human being who is filled with human rage and has lost all control because 
Jesus was sinless and blameless. Sinless and blameless. No one else can say that. You might be blameless because you've been covered, because righteousness has been attributed to you, and you're covered by that gift of grace, but no one can say that they're sinless, can they? Jesus was sinless. Who on this earth has been sinless that feels equipped to go and portray the Son of God? That is foolish arrogance. It is completely counterfeit, and we should not be entertaining ourselves with that. We end up with an image of Jesus that we have not received from the Holy Spirit, an internal representation that does not come from God. And, you know, I'm pretty sensitive to this because I experience this, you know, (laughs) several times a week with people coming on the channel and accusing me of somehow representing things incorrectly. And in the, in the midst of saying things like Jesus kissed the cross, what? That was something that someone said to me a week or two ago, uh, you know, regarding me talking about the cross as being an image. The cross is an image. You're wearing a cross around your neck. You got it on your rear view mirror in your home where I don't care where it is. It is an image. The word talks about the significance of the cross, not the image of the cross. The word says you are to have no images of anything in heaven or on earth. The image of the cross was established by Constantine of the Catholic harlot. And so this person came on the channel to say, I'm sounding like the Mormons in all caps. Whatever. I don't really care about the accusation. But interestingly enough, The very next thing that she said was Jesus kissed the cross. Jesus kissed the cross? You didn't get that from the Bible, honey. You got that from probably the Passion of the Christ movie and the image that you now have in your head of Jesus kissing an image. That's disgusting. And so the spirit in you wants to fight me because I'm calling it out. It's problematic. These little details get into your heart. You see them. You hear them. It's salient. It's a salient way of brainwashing you. I'm going to be talking about that in a separate video regarding Sound of Freedom and the Passion of the Christ and Father Stew, all of this propaganda that's being put out. Because Hollywood has a lot of influence on you, but you're the one allowing it. And guess who else has influence on Hollywood? Catholicism. You want to know God, go to God himself. Learn about him with him, from him, in relationship with him. You are not having a relationship with him through television or cinema or YouTube. You need to go to his spirit. Now, the other conversation that I had with someone today was regarding children. And I want you to understand that we are supposed to be occupied by God. We've been designed as a vessel. We've been designed as a temple, a vessel to be occupied by God. As you read the Bible, you realize that the that Solomon built that first temple, but the only way that it became, and he dedicated that temple to God, but the only way that it became a temple is when God said, I've heard your prayer and I've chosen this temple and I'm going to be here. This is where I'm going to dwell. I've chosen this place for my dwelling. There are tons of temples that have been dedicated supposedly to God on this earth. Are they God's temples? Is the Mormon temple God's temple? The thing that makes a temple a temple, God's temple, is that he's chosen that place to dwell. And guess what? God didn't dwell in temples made by human hands anymore. He has chosen us to be his dwelling, but he has to continue to occupy us in order for us to continue to be his temple. If another spirit is occupying us, we just became that spirit's temple. So if it's hard enough for you to fan into flame God's Holy Spirit and to remain occupied by God and to have these temptations that you, you know, you developed kind of a relationship and habits with doing things like watching TV, letting the TV run all day or coming home and watching a show, occupying yourself with technology and all of these different distractions. So it's hard to not, it's, it's, it's hard. I can see people sorting through this and it's something I've sorted through myself is, man, I really would like, I wish there was like something that I could veg out on that wasn't so toxic and dangerous to my soul. Why do I have that desire? Am I supposed to be vegging out on anything? No, I am supposed to be learning how to find joy in the things that God finds joyful. If you raise your children 
to read scripture with you and you make that a fun, enjoyable thing, a time for connection with you, a time for connection with God, if that's what you're doing, your children will learn to find that joyful. And I've been learning this with you, with Jeremiah because I was, you know, initially in order to get things, you know, like do the dishes or something like that, I would put on like a nursery rhyme and a cartoon, you know, like in cartoon and I would set him in his little chair to watch that. But I started to realize, you know, if I start making this a habit for Jeremiah, eventually he's going to get older and he's going to watch cartoons and he's not going to want to watch baby cartoons. He's going to want to watch big kid cartoons. And you know what? In those big kid cartoons, they are filled with satanic propaganda and garbage. Is this what I want to start teaching my little grandson? Do I want to teach him how to distract himself or do I want to teach him what God finds joyful? Do I want to teach him how to be inhabited by the Holy Spirit all the time. And it starts now. That training starts now. When my little grandson is a baby, he needs to become used to interacting with grandma. If I'm washing the dishes, there's no problem. I can talk with him while I wash the dishes. I can talk with him while I'm making food. I can sing songs with him. There are things that I can do with him. But you know, here's the here's part of the problem. Like our lives have become so busy that we relegate what actually matters to God to being things that we'll do if we have the time. And that needs to change. We need to make the time to do the things that are important to God and everything else is secondary. You make that time. You know, I was having, I was kind of struggling with, uh, you know, contractors or, you know, workers and things like that, uh, a lot of times they would want to do a job on Saturday because maybe that's the time that they had to do it or, you know, what they were going to do is kind of a side job for them. So they have that extra time, whatever, whatever the situation is. But I observe Sabbath on Saturday from Friday night to Saturday night. I am in Sabbath and I don't feel good about having people over here doing work during God's Sabbath. I can't do that. I can't have that. I can't say, well, it's, it's good enough for me to observe Sabbath, but this, you know, what, what the word would refer to as a foreigner, someone who's not in Christ or not, does not know, leading them into doing work on uh, God's Sabbath, I can't do that. And so I started letting people know when they would say, hey, you know, how about Saturday I would say, you know, that's the only day. You can you can come here any day and do work, but from Friday evening until Saturday evening, I'm observing Sabbath, and so I don't feel good having someone come and work. But what about, you know, they need to I I need this thing. I need them to do this thing and I want them to do it now. What about it? What about all that stuff? You set it second, God takes care of the rest. He will make sure that everything you need in this life is taken care of, but he might test you. He might test you with things like, okay, so now it's not going to get done for another week. Well, what's going to be more important to you? Obeying him or having what you want right now? Setting a good example, leading, you know, being an example to the foreigner of someone who's actually committed to what God has commanded. So you make the time to do the things that are important to God. You make sure that you are prioritizing the things that are important to God and everything else will be added. Everything else, you're going to be taken care of. He knows you need to eat. He knows you need clothes. He knows you need a roof over your head. He will take care of you. We need to make these things a priority. It doesn't make any sense for two parents to be working all to provide some sort of education for their child. Stay home, educate your child. God will take care of everything else. Don't relegate your responsibilities to technology, television, and other people. God gave you those children. You are going to make parenting your children infinitely more difficult because of all of the things that they're going to be exposed to if they go to if they go away to go to school. How many hours are they spending learning from other children? 
and from other adults, you think you're going to be able to counteract that? It is the most important responsibility that you could have to be in charge of one of God's children. You see as an adult how difficult it is to be circumcised from this world. It just wants to suck you in. And all the more, now that we're in these last days, you are enticed at every turn. And the strength of your flesh is so potent because we've lived these lives of giving in all the time. The world tells us that this is normal just to succumb to the desires of our flesh. And then we wonder why we're attacked. We wonder why we have a spirit. You know, I, in talking with one of my friends today, she was telling me that she no longer has those, that, that feeling of attack, like, you know, the bad nightmares and the fear attack and, and these kinds of things. And the reason why, and she said, you know, I think that the devil has kind of given up or whatever. No, it's not that the devil has given up. It's that she's been living in the heart and spirit by God's spirit. She's been fanning in to flame God's spirit And so that is what's strong in her right now. And God is only going to allow the devil to do what God is using to test you. Anytime that you're being tempted, you are also being tested by God. And what is he doing? He's testing the structure to make sure that you're sturdy enough. He's checking out whether you're ready to serve him. It's so funny because when God first draws us to him, we're like, Okay, use me. I'm ready. I'm ready. (laughs) We're not ready. There is so much crushing that needs to happen before we're ready. We just have no clue. That's how God's going to test you and build you to make sure that you're ready to serve him. Now, in talking with the other friend that I was speaking with today, she was telling me that, um, you know, there are some children who she knows who are close with her who are having difficulty, like they're seeing images in their minds and in their dreams that they should not be seeing. They should not be exposed to that. And it's not necessarily something that it may have been something that they saw in a scary movie or any number of places. I mean, really, if you think about, uh, I remember uh, my daughter getting scared at the movie Snow White when we, when she was, well, I was going to say when we were kids, no, when she was a kid. Well, yeah, that movie's terrifying. I mean, now I realize it. The part that she got scared of is when the huntsman like has a a, a knife in his hand and he like, you know, kind of holds the knife back because he's getting ready to stab. What the heck have we been showing our kids? And I remember her getting like that freaked her out. And I was like, well, duh. Yeah, this is not for kids. Any more than the sorcery or the witch or the dragon in Sleeping Beauty. I mean, like, what is, what have we been showing our kids? So they have, they see these things, they're exposed to these things, and then it leaves them vulnerable because we're not spiritually protecting them. Because we're teaching them to distract themselves with things of the world, to become conformed to the pattern of the world. So now we've taken the most vulnerable precious creations on this earth and just handed them over to the world and the prince of the world. What's going to be occupying them, guys? It's so wrong. If it's hard for us as adults to do this, how much more vulnerable are our children? They don't even have an, they don't even have a a, a chance. We just handed them over. Why? Because we're too lazy to interact with them. We're too lazy to pick up the responsibility God has given us. Yeah, it's extra work. It's extra steps to interact with our children. And guess what? That's what it's all about. That's what that God designed it that way. The devil is subtle. He's cunning. I was watching, um, you know, early on when, when Jeremiah was first born, we were watching like this baby sounds and like we visit the farm and, you know, like stuff like that, right? Is a show called Miss Rachel. And then as we're watching it, we're seeing like that. I, I don't know what that is. Is that a female or is that a male? Kind of seems like she's introducing babies to genderless people. And that's exactly what she was doing. Oh, fantastic. It was so subtle. This is what the world does. Your children need to be educated by you. Your children need to be sheltered by you because they don't have the ability to discern these things. They just it gobble them up. They ingest them. 
because they're being exposed to them all the time as you outsource your parental responsibilities to the world. Now that's become normative and you're the freak. And then parents wonder why their children won't obey them. Why are they doing these things? Oh, they're just rebellious. Oh, it must be their fallen state. I mean, good grief. I hear parents say that all the time. They want to say that to take away the responsibility that they just outsourced. Your child is in school with other people for eight hours every day. Do you think you're going to undo all that during dinner and rushing that child off to bed and counterfeit church on Sunday? You're not. You just handed your child over to the wolves. We all need to be figuring out, and if that means that we need to come together as communities, as families, In order to raise these children right, then that's what we need to be doing. Children do not need 5,000 toys and all of the associations that go with those characters. You need to raise your children correctly in the home so that when they go out into the world, they'll be sensitized to God and they're going to know when these things are wrong, that they're not okay. And... Do not raise your children to be robots. You spend time with them. Talk with them. Share your personal spiritual journey. Be a shepherd to your child, not a dictator to your child. Because developmentally, your child might listen to you until they're, what, eight or nine years old, and then they start going through that little preteen phase. And now you've lost all control. And you know what? It's your own fault. Because if you don't give your child some freedom to have their own thoughts and their own ideas and to respect that with them while still speaking truth and sharing your testimony, you are going to have a rebellious child on your hands because you didn't teach them the way that they should go. You expected that they would just have you as an idol for the rest of their life. So please don't misunderstand what I am saying. I am. There are two extremes, right? And we need to learn how to be shepherds to our children. Remember, if, if you're struggling with this, because I know that a lot of us struggle with it because we were all parented incorrectly, take a look at the way that Solomon talks with his son. He's mentoring his son. It's like he, his son is with him. Look at the way that Jesus mentored his disciples. Look at the way that Paul fathered the church. And I'm not saying you call him father. That's not what Paul was doing, but he did talk about having this parental role with the young church. Look at the way that that was done. It was done with testimony. It was done with truth. It was done with teaching and with gentleness, but also discipline and also truth. Like you're letting them know this is hard. It is hard. It's not easy. And yet our joy is before us. Our joy is waiting for us. If we can withhold from ourselves now, we have something that we can't even imagine waiting for us in heaven. How awesome would that have been if you had been raised that way to understand if you just withhold i know that this is hard i know that it's hard it's hard for me too let's pray together let's ask god for strength in this situation let's ask god to teach us how to have joy how to live a joyful life in the way that he experiences joy help them to sort through their thoughts and their feelings have dialogues with them, spend more time, turn the boob tube off, maybe even remove it from your home. But these children who are having nightmares, who are seeing images, they're being attacked by spirits, you guys. And and those images, what's happening is that they've been exposed to something. Now they have a chink in their armor and it's the fault of the parent. And now a spirit has entered them and is attacking them. This is not right. We need to be responsible first as parents. Then our children will be okay. We need to be repentant as parents, and then we will be able to teach our children how to repent. We need to stop saying, well, I'm an adult, so I can do whatever I want. We need to withhold from ourselves. Then we will be able to shepherd our children correctly instead of imposing harsh burdens on them that we ourselves are not even willing to obey. Because just as our children have parents, we also have a parent in heaven. And he expects us to walk in the authority we've been given correctly. We need to teach our children what their design is and how to occupy themselves correctly with good wine, good bread, 
doctrine that is true. And the only way that we can do that is if we are correctly protecting them. You can't send your child off for someone else to raise them and then blame them because they're ingesting defiled food in the world. It's not fair. You're setting them up for failure. Please discern this message with God. And if you are in a situation where you're like, I, but what can I do? I have to go. I have to go to work. I'm a single parent. Whatever it is, pray. Anything that you pray in God's will, in his name, that's his will. Anything that you pray in his will and you rend your heart to whatever it is that is his will, he is going to make a way. He is going to give it to you. He promises it in his word. Now believe that and go pray for it.